Hi. In this session, I'd like to talk about accounting ratios. Now, before we get too caught up in the mechanics, think of why we compute ratios. When you compare, com compare absolute numbers across companies or across time, you're, measure, you're comparing apples to oranges. Why? Because a large company will have higher profits in dollar value terms or absolute terms than a smaller company. So here's a simple fix. We compute ratios. We scale your profits, your investment, whatever number you want to compare to something that companies have in common. Now, one of the things you'll notice with ratios is what we use to scale these numbers to can give you very different sets of ratios. And in practice, I think people compute too many ratios and they use them to advance agendas. So what I'd like to do is take ratios and talk about how you can classify these ratios and how you can use them to compare across companies across time and to some kind of benchmark. So let's start with profit margins. The essence of margins, you're scaling to revenues. So every single margin calculation will have revenues in the denominator. But you can have different measures of profit margins depending on what you put in the numerator. You're saying, what are you talking about? I could just subtract out the variable costs associated with the products and services I produce. I get what's called contribution margin. So that's just after the variable cost of production, the cost of that additional unit. Contribution margin. If I subtract out the rest of cost of goods sold, the other costs associated with producing my products and services that I sell, I come up with gross margin. If I subtract out other operating expenses like R&D, SG&A, I come up with operating margin. If I then net out the taxes I'd have paid on that operating income, I come up with an after-tax operating margin. And finally, if I go all the way down to the bottom of my income statement, and I take net income and divide by revenues, I come up with net margin. And I can take some tangential paths along the way. I can take EBITDA, earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, amortization, arguing that's a measure of the cash profits of my business and divide by revenues, I get EBITDA margins. And I can even add back R&D saying that's really not an operating expense and come up with a margin based on that EBITDA plus R&D. Now you can see why when people talk about margins, we have to be specific. Now, I think there is information in each of these measures, and I want to talk a little bit about what that information is. When you look at contribution and gross margins, you're getting a measure of how profitable this company is on that additional unit that it sells. When companies have low, con low, low variable costs or low cost of goods sold relative to revenues, they get very high contribution and gross margins. Their revenues has flown to profits. So as they grow, you're going to see their profits grow proportionately. So when you take a company like Zoom, for instance, where the, where the gross margin is 92%, the cost of that additional person that they add on as a subscriber is only 8%, you can see as they add on subscribers, their profits are going to change very, very quickly. So the information and contribution and gross margins tells you something about the marginal economics of this business. What do they have to spend to add that additional subscriber, that additional dollar of revenues? So that's what you learn from contribution and gross margins. When you subtract that the rest of operating expenses, R&D, SG&A, you come up with operating margins. And operating margins give you a measure of overall business profitability. Now, when you look at operating margins by themselves, you think, what do I learn from this? If you compare gross to operating margins, there's value in that comparison. If you have a company with high gross margins and low operating margins, very simply put, this company has a lot in other operating expenses, right? R&D, SG&A, you're saying, so what? If you make that additional leap or the additional assumption that those expenses are more fixed than your traditional cost of goods sold. They grow at a lower rate than revenues. You're setting a stage for an economies of scale argument. So let's say you're looking at a small company. It's got very high gross margins and very low or even negative operating margins. And you assume this company's revenues will grow over time. I can see a basis for very rapid improvement in operating margins because as they grow, the operating margin should improve. Now, when you go to EBITDA margin, which is a side story, you're getting a measure of how much cash this company throws off as a percent of revenues. You're saying, why should I care? It's a big factor in how much you can borrow because to borrow money, you are essentially committing to pay interest and principal payments in the future for which you need cash flows. 
companies with higher EBITDA margins holding all else constant have a much greater capacity to generate cash from the business and that cash can be used to service them. In fact, when you look at big infrastructure businesses, even those not making much money, they'll often have high EBITDA margins and many of them carry that. Now we can debate whether that makes sense or not, but EBITDA margins measure the cash profits you throw off as a business. Finally, there's net margin. Net margin measures how profitable this business is to the equity investors in the business. You think, why would that be any different than business profitability? Let me ask you a question. Can a business be profitable, but its equity investors collect very little? Yes. And here's what can happen. If you borrow a lot of money, you have interest expenses. Those interest expenses come out of your operating income. So as you lever up, your net income is going to drop. That might still be okay if your share count is decreasing, but if your equity stays fixed and your net income drops, your net margin will decrease. Generally, when you see companies with a big difference between operating and net margin, the difference is due to debt. The companies with a lot of debt will, will get a much bigger divergence between these numbers. So if you look at these margins, there's a life cycle perspective you can adopt. Young companies, very young companies, here's what you should expect to see. Your gross margins can be healthy as a young company, but your operating and your net margins can be negative. Why? Because you still haven't made enough money yet. You have a lot of fixed costs you've got to cover. If you borrowed money, it makes things worse. As you grow as a company, here's what should happen. Your revenue should scale up. Your gross margin will not change as you grow because your gross margin is still your gross margin. So after cost of goods sold, but your operating margin, your net margin should improve over time. As you get to maturity and you start borrowing money, the operating and net margins can diverge if you choose to borrow money. And then you get in decline, both operating and net margins will decline. And you've got to be careful because if you don't pay off debt as you decline, your net margin could turn negative and you could be in distress. So when you look at a company's margins, bring into play where this company is in the life cycle. Those are profit margins. You're scaling profits to revenues. But ultimately, as a business, you tie up capital. Accounting returns measure profits scaled to capital invested in the business rather than revenues. You're saying, who's measuring the capital? Well, accountants are. In fact, broadly speaking, when you look at returns on capital, no matter how they're measured, you're looking at a very accounting perspective on profitability. Now, why might accounting returns vary for the same company, depending on who's doing them. It depends on first, how you measure profits. Are you looking at net profits or operating profits? Are you looking at before tax or after tax? It's also going to depend on how you measure investment. Are you measuring it as investment made by the equity investors in the company? Or are you measuring total investment? Are you looking at um, returns across time? Or are you looking at returns at a point in time? What I'm trying to say is don't expect people to have a consensus on what the returns are because there are choices you make that can affect it. There's a very simple consistency rule, though, that you've got to keep in mind when you compute accounting returns. If your numerator measures returns to one group of investors, your denominator has to be to that same group. You think, what are you talking about? If you're looking at net income in the numerator, that's income to equity investors, your denominator has to be capital invested by just equity investors. You cannot mismatch. So broadly speaking, there are two measures of accounting returns. One is returns to equity, returns on equity, and the other is return on overall invested capital. Let's start with the return equity. For return on equity, in the numerator, you usually have net income. Now we can debate whether that net income should be before or after extraordinary items whether it should be an average across the year, whether it should, be, the debate can be about how you compute net income, but the numerator is always a net income. In the denominator, you need a measure of equity invested in this company. And here's something to keep in mind. When you see accounting returns, you're going to wear an accountant's hat. You know how accountants measure how much equity is invested? They show it in the balance sheet as shareholders' equity. Now, we can again debate whether we should be using shareholders equity at the start of the period, at the end of the period, or some average, but returns in equity almost always have net income in the numerator, equity invested in the denominator. Alternatively, you can look at return to the entire company. You think, what does that mean? Remember, you can get capital from two sources, equity and debt. When you look at return in invested capital, you can look at the returns to all capital investors in the company. So here's what's going to be different. Instead of looking at net income, you're looking at operating income. 
And to the extent that you want to measure how much you make after taxes, you're going to act like you get taxed on that operating income. So in the numerator, you get operating income net of taxes. In the denominator, you need a measure of how much capital is invested in this company. Remember with return equity, we call shareholders equity the measure of equity invested in this company. Here's what we're going to do for invested capital. We're going to add the debt that you show on the balance sheet to the equity. But we're not going to stop that because remember, if you have cash and marketable securities as a company, it's not invested in the operations of the company. So you're going to net cash out. Debt plus equity minus cash is invested capital. After tax operating income divided by invested capital is return on invested capital. We'll come back and revisit this number over and over again in both corporate finance and valuation. But while it looks simple, there are judgment calls you'll be required to make that can affect what you end up as a return on invested capital. You might have to think about, should I be adjusting the operating income for things like R&D and leases? Remember, we talked about the accounting inconsistency. The answer is absolutely yes. And in the denominator, you're going to face challenges of what do I do about capitalized R&D, the leases that I treat as debt. So those accounting inconsistencies we talked about in the last session will play out in the return capital. In fact, one reason we make such a big deal about cleaning up for leases and R&D is to get a better sense of what the return invested capital is. And as with, with return equity, you have to make decisions on, do I want to look at invested capital at the start of the year, the end of the year, or some average number? But basically, you're trying to get a sense of what am I earning on my existing projects as a company? So as I said, we will talk about this with, in much more detail in both the corporate finance and valuation classes, but at least we've set the table. So we've talked about profit margins. We've talked about accounting returns. Let's talk about efficiency ratios. What do efficiency ratios measure? They measure how much you generate as revenues for every cap dollar of capital you invest. It's a measure of the efficiency with which a company can deliver growth. So revenues and efficiency ratios usually are in the numerator rather than the denominator. Remember with margins, they were in the denominator. With efficiency ratios, they're in the numerator. Now, what you divide revenues by will give you measures of efficiency relative to different kinds of investment. I could divide revenues by working capital. This is something that people have done. They come up with accounts receivable ratios. And these are called turnover ratios. Basically, you're looking at, a by looking at the ratio of revenues to working capital, you're looking at how efficiently does a company manage its working capital. The higher this number, the more efficiently you're rolling working capital over. You could divide revenues by total assets. What does that measure? The higher this number, the more revenues you generate for every dollar of assets you invest in. Or you can divide revenues by invested capital. That same invested capital we used to return invested capital can go in the denominator here. That measure for, measures for every dollar of capital you invest as a company, how many dollars of revenues you generate as a company. This is going to be an incredibly useful ratio later when we talk about investing and valuing young companies because it's going to tell us how much companies will have to reinvest to get those promised revenues that they need to deliver to be valuable companies. So efficiency ratios, you're measuring how quickly companies can grow and how much they need to reinvest to get that growth. Let's talk about financial leverage. Companies can choose to borrow. They can choose not to borrow. And when you look at a company, one of the things you want to measure is how much has my company borrowed? That's what debt ratios do. But what you scale the debt to can give you different measures of debt ratios. There are two ways you can look at that. One is you can scale debt to the capital invest in the company. You can look at you know, how many dollars of debt do I have for every dollar of equity, which is called debt to equity, or how many dollars of debt do I have relative to every dollar of capital. Those are debt to capital ratios. So the difference between debt to equity and debt to capital is debt to capital, you divide debt by debt plus equity. Debt to equity, you divide debt by equity. There you're scaling debt to capital. You can also scale debt to cash flows. You're saying, why would I need to do that? You're looking at how much coverage you have, how much capacity you have to make those debt payments. So debt to EBITDA is a measure of how much debt you have for the, the EBITDA, which is the cash you generate as a company. So when you look at debt ratios, you need to keep in mind that you can get different numbers depending on the choices you make. For instance, you have to decide what to include in debt. There are some who use only long-term debt. I've never understood the calculus of this, but they include only long-term debt. Others use all interest-bearing debt. Still others include other contractual commitments like lease commitments. I've been including lease commitments as debt for 30 years. Now accountants have caught on as well, but that choice will drive what you come up with as debt ratios.
You can look at book or market. You're saying, what are you talking about? Remember I said you can compute the debt to equity ratio. You can stay with the accounting measure of debt and the accounting measure of equity, shareholders equity. That's a book debt to equity ratio. Or you can use market value for debt and market value for equity. If you're a publicly traded company, market value of equity is just market capitalization. Market value of debt might require a little dancing around, but you can estimate that as well. So book or market. And finally, on debt itself, you have to make a choice on whether you want to look at total debt, gross debt, or do whether you want to net cash out of that debt to come up with net debt. Again, the logic is impeccable. If you have $100 million in debt and $100 million in cash, there are some who look at that this company effectively has no debt because if it chooses to, it can use the cash to pay off the debt. I'm not disagreeing with the logic, but you have to make a choice and stay consistent. So when you look at debt ratios, it's worth asking these questions. What went into debt? Is there a book or market ratio? Is it gross debt or net debt? Finally, let's look at liquidity and credit risk ratios. What you're trying to measure is the risk that your company could get into trouble because its contractual obligations are too large for its earnings or cash flows. There are two sets of ratios you can look at. One are coverage ratios. What are coverage ratios? You look at how much buffer this company has. I mean, to be explicit, let me give you two examples. There's a ratio called the interest coverage ratio, where you divide operating income divided by interest expense. So if you have $100 in operating income and $20 in interest expense, your interest coverage ratio is five. You think, what does that tell me? The higher this number, the more buffer you have as a company in case something goes wrong. The lower this number, the riskier you are as a company. That's interest coverage ratios. You can expand the definition of, of, fix, uh, of, of contractual obligations beyond interest expenses to include other fixed charges. And there you can divide something that includes those fixed charges in the numerator as well. What you're doing here is you're looking at not just interest expense, but other fixed charges. Again, the higher this number, the more buffer you have as a company. So coverage ratios measure buffer. Liquidity ratios measure near-term risk. And there are two sets of liquidity ratios that are widely used. One is a current ratio, where you divide current assets by current liabilities. It's a ratio that's been used a long time. The argument being the higher the current ratio, the more liquid you are. You have the assets to pay off your liabilities. Implicitly are assuming that current assets can be easily liquidated and used to pay off your current liabilities. Well, that might or might not be true, right? How do you easily liquidate inventory? So the ratio called the quick ratio, where you net out inventory from current assets, saying that's really not that liquid, but it's a variant. Here again, you're measuring if we get into trouble in the near term, do we have the cash to cover those needs? So when you look at ratios, again, what you're trying to do is come up with a scaled mechanism, a scaled variable you can compare across companies. And with ratios, as we will see in the final session, it's good to look at differences across companies and differences for your own company across time. I hope you found the session useful and thank you very much for listening.